last Sunday, Mrs. Angle did the, the children's story, right? And you guys were over there and you helped um, decorate the church. Can we go back over there? I want to see if you really got that story out. Meet me over there. Let's go over there.
don't disrupt it. You, you guys know how that stuff fits into the story of Christmas, so put it where it belongs in the story. The Christmas tree goes right there. Can't jump me. Oh, don't know, you probably heard about the blue tree. Oh, and then, yeah, okay, Christmas tree inside the house, that makes sense, and the reindeer, and the cat with the ornaments. Oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the ornaments. And the, and the penguin should be walking to Jesus, yes. And the, yes, and okay, so you guys now see how this all fits together, right? Carter, tell us, tell us what the poop reindeer has to do with the Christmas story of Jesus. Does anybody know what the, oops, what does a penguin have to do with the Christmas story of Jesus? You know? What is it? Put the bee on the Christmas tree. Yeah, well, guess what? None of the things I brought have anything to do with the story of Christmas. None of them do. And yet, they're part of the decorations that the crazy Kurtz family puts around their house. These little pooping animals that we think are so funny. And the Christmas tree that goes on our little table. And the, the kitty that's in the window because it came from a foreign country. And yeah, I mean, we just hear that, just leave it all right here. But this guy right here, this guy right here. Oh, no, no, he's, he is part of the Christmas stuff. But all my stuff over here that I get it all back, guess what? All of this just has to do with the way we decorate the Christmas in my house. And yes, we have a, a Jesus scene too, and we love that. But this guy right here is one of my favorite Christmas decorations. You know why? Because this guy right here reminds me of what Christmas really does for me with Jesus. Do you know what this thing is? What is it? It's a snowman, but what is it? What's up? It's a candle, but look. Is there a candle in it? There's no candle in it. I know. Wait, wait. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, be careful. Be careful. You don't do so. Look, I want to show you something. You can't touch it. Can you guys back up so everybody can see it? Back up. No. That snowman is one of my favorite, favorite Christmas um, decorations of Kurt's house. Because I think it's cute, but also because of this. No, look at this guy. Because he's supposed to have a candle in him, but he doesn't. And here's the message of Christmas. Now back up, back up. Here's the message of Christmas. This is kind of like me. I don't look quite like you. Can you back up a little? This is kind of like me. Yeah, it's just me. Kind of stiff. Kind of cute. Kind of round. Kind of historical. And what Jesus does at Christmas is Jesus goes, no, no, no. Jesus came because he knew I didn't have any light inside of me. And Jesus goes, no, no, I can fix that. And Jesus becomes, come on, light. Jesus becomes the light inside of you. That's the message of Christmas. It's not about a snowman. It's really about this. The Jesus inside of you. What's the light of God inside of me? Oh, don't blow it out. I'm going to take this back home. For whatever you guys can do is remember. You know, this is the story of Christmas. This is just the fun part. But he, why? So you can blow it out? No. Oh, uh-huh. I see right through that one. All right, let me pray for you guys, and then, and then you can go and sit with your folks. Come on, everybody in. Everybody in. Come close. Come close. Not so close. Everybody close your eyes. Jesus, thank you for putting the light inside of us. Thank you for the real meaning of Christmas, and thank you for, for fun Christmas decorations. And Lord, we thank you for these children. In your name. Thank you, I'm going to invite us to, to pause right now and pray to the Lord that he would use the words of ancient scripture to talk to us in 2013. When God does that, that is so wonderful. So let's pray. Lord, um, we need to see ourselves in these pages of scripture. Uh, we need to hear your message, and um, you know, you've brought a good number of people here this morning, and each of us have this in common. Each one of us is human, 
each one of us needs you as our Savior. And then there are the things that, that um, are not the same for all of us. Some of us have come to that point of realization that we need you as a Savior and you have saved us. And some of us are still on the journey to that, that decision to open our hearts to you. We please speak to both of us, both groups this morning, we pray in your name. Amen. Uh, wow, welcome to winter. Was that cool the other night? I mean, the, the weather forecasters, I mean, this is like revolutionary. They got it right. right? And, and it was great. I mean, five to seven inches of snow, depending on, on where you live. And I don't know about you, but I didn't move on Friday. Well, I didn't have to move on Friday. I'm a teacher. We got a snow day. So I, I shoveled my driveway just for fun because I had no intention of going anywhere at all. And I did. And it was great. Uh, Saturday came and I was a little convicted about the fact that I was pretty selfish with my entire Friday. I read over 100 pages in a book by Jane Austen. Um, I watched Christmas movies with my wife. I mean, I did nothing on behalf of, of the world or anybody else. So Saturday I woke up and I said, I need to get the snow shovel out and help somebody out. So Linda and I um, loaded the snow shovels and the salt and we headed first to my in-laws, to her, her mom's. And, and stepdads, and we got over there, and, and we started shoveling. And look, Linda was using the plastic shovel for like hours, and I was using a shovel I found in my brother's garage. Right after he moved back to Boston, he left the garage full of stuff, and I went root around, and I found one of those old-fashioned metal snow shovels that we've all gotten rid of because they're too heavy. But man, they're good. Um, and, and, and so we went over to my in-laws, and, and I'm it wasn't shoveling snow, it was acting like a snow plow. I mean, the thing's incredible because it's, it's got that metal blade. So I would get it and I'd turn it out as a, a, at an angle. Your husband would love the fact like this. And I'd run it all out like a snow plow. And it was, it was great. The snow was just flying all over the place. Good fluffy snow does that. And then all of a sudden, I'm running. My father in law, um, his son is the one that almost died of a heart attack this fall. And so he's been really busy. And he never did get to finishing cleaning up the leaves, uh, the ones that were now rotten and in big piles underneath. And, and he never quite got to spray and round up on some of that stuff that grows up in your driveway. So I'm running along on the snow plow and wham, I hit that stuff. I almost impaled myself with the back end of a snow shovel. And all of a sudden, it wasn't as much fun anymore. <laughs> Well, I continued the job, and, and Linda finished her part of the job. She did all the sidewalks, and I was doing the driveway, and she went in, and I said, come on in and talk to your mom in the gym, and, and just, you, you, you relax in the warm house. I'll finish up out here. And so I'm out there, I'm working hard, and, and she came to the door after about 10 minutes. She goes, um, Mom says, are you almost done out there? And I said, I'm, I'm, I'm doing all right. I, I, obviously, I'll be in in five minutes, and that really meant 15 minutes, because I knew how long it was going to take me. And I continued to shovel, and D rotten leaf their driveway and the grass and mud their driveway and it looked awful on the side on this muddy snow and while they were inside the house saying more it was great I actually I, I loved it but I was thinking about it I think what I discovered on Saturday rotten leaves and grass growing up where it should have been sprayed with roundup and killed a long time ago covered by a white blanket of snow, nobody would know that it was there. Describes an awful lot of us in our hearts. All of us have had times in our lives where we have some stuff going on, you know, it's just stuff, and we make bad choices and we say things and those are the leaves that fall and if we would just take care of them right now, it would be okay. But we don't, we let them rot. And, and they get wet, and they get heavy, and they get harder to take care of the longer we go. And all of us have, have had times in our lives where we let little things grow up in, into the cracks of our hearts and souls, and we should have rooted it out when it was little, but we didn't. We didn't spread it with the roundup. We didn't deal with it when it was a little issue. And now it's pretty deeply entrenched in the driveway of who we are. But life keeps going, right? And the next season of life comes along, and now there's a blanket of snow, and you don't know what's under there until it's time to take care of the snow. And then it's a lot harder job to get rid of the rotting stuff and the and rooted stuff in the driveway of our hearts and souls. I wonder if that's a metaphor that the writer of Psalm 107 
would have included had he shoveled with me yesterday. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want to take you back to where we were last week, Psalm 107. It's a really cool psalm because it tells the Jesus story of the nation of Israel. And at every point in the Jesus story in the nation of Israel, it kind of ends up the same. It comes out from different angles, but it goes, you had rotten leaves in your life, didn't you? You had things enrooted in your soul that you needed to get out of, didn't you? And now you feel badly about it, don't you? Well, Psalm 107 is a song that kind of says, that's great news. Because the message of Advent, the message of the incarnation of Jesus, the message of Jesus coming is, when you finally figure out there's rotting stuff under there, and you realize you can't do it alone, that's the moment that Jesus walks up with a shovel and says, uh, mind if I shovel your driveway for you? Let me show you what I mean. We're not going to read the, the whole psalm. I just want to start with um, where it starts in verses 1, 2, and 3, and then jump to the second Jesus story part. Psalm 107, verse 1, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. Last week we looked at that and we said this. This is what that first verse tells us. It starts in the character of God. The God in his very character is good. He can't help it. It's part of who he is. He is good. And his love endures forever. And we talked about that last week, that the Hebrew of that translates a little fun here. His love endures forever really should say his love forever. That it didn't have a starting point. It's always been. And it doesn't have an ending point. It always will be. So I love the fact that Psalm 107 starts in the character of God. That God is good and his love. His love. But then it goes to the actions of God in verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered, gathered from the lands from east and west and north and south. And we talked last week that if, if you want to sum this, sum this whole psalm up, and the first part is, look, God is about the business of gathering people that need redemption. And some of them he gathers all the way from Sydney and Piqua, and some come from Versailles, and some come from Troy, and some come from West Melbourne, and every place in between. And he gathers them together because the God who is love and, and, and the God who is essentially good gets people together so that he can woo them to his love and forgiveness. That's where Psalm 107 starts. And last week we dealt with the verses like, four through um, nine, and we discovered what that was all about. But now we're going to jump to the second Jesus story in the psalm and go to verse 10. Look what it says in verse 10. Some sat in darkness and the deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in iron chains, for they have rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High, so he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled, and there was no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness and the deepest gloom and, woke them, and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for men. For he breaks down the gates of bronze and cuts through the bars of iron. I don't know about you guys, but um, I kind of look at those verses, uh, especially 10, 11, and 12, and I say, you know what? That sounds an awful lot like my father-in-law's driveway. I mean, there's, there's rotting leaves under the snow. There's grass that's, that's gone down into the cracks of my heart and taken root. And yes, I know it. Should have taken care of those leaves back in, in October. And should have sprayed the Roundup off the little weeds that get inside my heart back in July and August. But I didn't, and the reality is they're there. And the result is I can relate to verse 10. Because verse 10 says this. Some sat in darkness and deepest gloom. You ever get hammered by the consequences of your own choices? That was a dumb question. If you are alive right now and you have a, a, a pulse, you have been caught in your own consequences. And the decisions that you make have left you in despair. Now, varying degrees, some of you are a lot better people than me. And so you haven't felt the despair. You haven't sat in darkness. You haven't been in deepest gloom. But some of us can relate to this, and it hurts. Let me tell you an example. We're not going to have a group counseling session with me, the counselee, and you a whole room full of therapists. I don't need that. Well, maybe I do need that. But I'm not going to go for that today. So let me tell you an example of a day where I felt 
darkness and deepest gloom, and it wasn't a sin issue, it was just a life issue. I used to drive the, the, one of the delivery trucks from the Happy Pie Company down in Dayton, and I had about 30 different accounts, grocery stores, factories, restaurants, and every day I would visit these places, stock shelves and sell pies and make money, and it was a commission deal. So I loved it when we came into fresh strawberry pie season because they were a high premium and an automatic sale. I had to go in an hour early. I had to make up the fresh strawberry pies at 4 a.m. so they would be fresh strawberry pies. And I would take them to my accounts and I would stock all the shelves and then I would go to the person in charge and I'd say, hey, just want you to know, I have a few, a handful of fresh strawberry pies this morning. Um, I already gave you what you ordered. Would you like some of these? I can only spare four. Oh, it was great. I was a good salesman and I could sell so many pies. I love fresh strawberry pie season. It was commission sales and it was automatic and there was nothing to pick up at the end of the day. It was great. And then one day, driven by my greed, I, packed, I made up and packed a whole rack of fresh strawberry in my truck. And I was so excited because every place I wanted, they were buying me out. I was going to be out of pies at 10 in the morning. This was a good day for commission. And after my second stop, I was so excited about how the first one went that I forgot to secure the rack. <laughs> and when I turned the corner, the whole rack, the whole rack, I had been endure that all day long because I knew that at the end of the day I had to walk back into the, the bakery and I had to meet with Dave Mahaffey of Mahaffey Pie Company and I had to tell him what I had done. And then I had to endure something called eating your loss. Oh man, if it were literal, I would have dumped a rack of spread strawberry pies every day. But it wasn't literal, it was figurative. <laughs> Eat your loss means I just bought the whole rack, which meant I had worked for almost free all day long and I dreaded it and I was in darkness and deepest gloom all day long trying to say how am I going to tell Dave that I did this and so I went into the office I said hey Dave I need to talk to you I really wish my name were Bob the other driver instead of Greg because you would like yell at Bob and be done with it and I could just grin that I didn't do it but, but Dave I got to tell you something Bob didn't do this today, I did. I dumped a whole rack. And I know you're gonna take it out of my pay. That was nonsense, darkness, and deepest gloom. And I brooded about it all day long. But sometimes, friends, and I'm not gonna share any of these stories with you, you can be disappointed if you want to. I have been in darkness and deepest gloom because my choices were sin and they were rotting leaves under the blanket of nobody knows about this, this is the snow of my life. And then I had to start dealing with it. Oh, oh look at the next description. The next description in that verse is um, verse 10, some sat in darkness and deepest gloom, prisoners suffering in chains. Yeah, prisoners suffering in chains. Sometimes those chains come when you're at a doctor's office and he said, I thought I told you four years ago to cut this out. And you go, yeah, well, I didn't cut it out. And he goes, yeah, well, now guess what? Now you have consequences to your bad health choices. Sometimes they come in your boss's office or if you're younger, in the principal's office. Sometimes they come when you're sitting at the dining room table alone because you had a, a really big fight with your spouse and now you're alone having to deal with the consequences of it. And sometimes those chains come when, when you're sitting in the lazy boy and your kids have broken their curfew and you know something's going on and you're sitting there and you're enchained by it. The funny thing is, wherever those chains of sin are, we have such a weird relationship with sin. Yeah. Um, we, we eat too much, we talk too much, we gossip too much, we drink too much, we complain too much, we do a lot of things too much. And we would do anything we can to get rid of the abuses of too much sin. But we're like dogs and vomit, we keep walking right back to it. And we keep consuming it over and over and over again because we realize that we're pretty addicted to our bad behavior. We are in, the words of the psalmist, we are prisoners suffering in iron chains. But the weird thing is about those iron chains, we put them on ourselves because we love vice and sin and wrongness. <laughs> this is crazy. And we would do anything, but you know what? 
in, in the context of Psalm 107, the regret we feel when we realize we're in chain is exactly where we need to be. Because once we realize we are in chains by our own sin, that's when we know we have to have a Savior who will come with a key to take the chains off. Now you get down to verse 12, and, and, and the whole thing just continues in verse 12. We get another description of it. So he said, and you're not going to like this part, I just warn you right now. So he subjected them to bitter labor, labor, they stumbled, and there was no one there to help. So he subjected them to bitter labor. Literally, it should be translated, to labor that broke their hearts. He subjected them to labor that broke their hearts, they stumbled, and there was no one to help. I hate to give you a grammar lesson. Okay, no, I don't. I'm an English teacher. I love giving grammar lessons. So he, subje he subjected them. He who? So he subjected them to bitter labor. Who's he? Who subjected these people to bitter labor? Anybody who would know the right answer to that one? Anybody? God did. Whoa, whoa. God subjected them to bitter labor, labor that was so heavy that it broke their hearts. God pushed them and made them stumble. And God isolated them so that they would not have anyone to pick them up. You got the right answer. Told you you wouldn't like that verse. God doesn't do that. You told us at the beginning, God's good and God's love. Yes, and in his goodness and in his love, sometimes God puts one hand on your back and he pushes you and allows you to make those choices that you already were ready to make. And you stumble and you fall and you're in prison and you're in darkness and there's nobody there to pick you up. You know why? Why would a loving God ever do that? So that you can finally come to terms with who you are. That you desperately need a Savior. Look, shoveling yesterday and discovering those rotting leaves underneath the snow and and, and, and seeing the grass that should have been taken care of by Roundup a long time ago. It connected with me as I had been looking at Psalm 107 the last couple of weeks, and I thought, yes, yes, that's it. Here's what God does. He comes to our lives, and he knows there's rotting leaves on the He knows that we have been isolated in darkness. He knows that we are imprisoned by our own sin and our own consequences. He knows all of that stuff. So he walks up to us. And he looks at the job and he goes, man, you got a lot of snow to get rid of, but under that snow there's a lot of other stuff you've got to get rid of. And then he says something to us that you're not going to believe until you really think about it. This God, who is essentially good, whose love tells us to go inside. Go in the house where it's warm. Go get yourself a cup of hot chocolate, take off your wet boots and gloves. I'm going to shovel this thing clean. You're saying, no, Greg, no, you got it right. Wrong. What God does is he says, here, let me shovel with you. No, no. God tells us, you just go over there and get warm. I'm going to clean your driveway for you, and I'm getting rid of the, the leaves that you should have gotten rid of a long time ago. And I'm going to take care of that grass. I mean, it's going to be a lot harder to dig out now. Should have done it when you could have. But I'm going to get rid of it. And when I call you back out, you're going to look at my driveway and go, wow, it's clean. That's the message of needing a Savior. We don't help God. He delivers us from who we are. That's forgiveness. Now, you've probably seen it on posters or coffee cups. It's one of those... Um, things that we market at Christmas time. This is actually one of the things we market at Christmas time that I love. That coffee cup, I have one that says, wise men still seek him. Good line. Good line. And it's exactly what the last verse of Psalm 107 is all about. Look at the last verse. Whoever is wise, let him heed these things and consider the great love of yeah, 
Maybe you're like me to go, oh boy, if I got some leaves that are rotten, I know they're under there. I need to take care of those. Man, do I have some stuff that's rooted down deep in my character that I could have gotten rid of a long time ago the easy way. The reality is it's there. And now life has snowed on it, and now I have to deal with it. I got great news. God is a forgiving God. He's a redeeming God. That's the message of the gospel. That's the message of Christmas, that we needed a Savior to come. And he came. And he told us to go inside while he takes care of business in our hearts. May God add his blessing to the reading and explanation.